hasn't healed you. And people say, but I got a doctor's report. That doesn't mean that you weren't healed. The Lord has already done everything about your healing that there is to do. It's not up to God to heal you. God wants every single person well. Now, it is true that not every person is going to receive, but it's not because God didn't heal you. It's not because God didn't move. It's the same thing as salvation. It is God's will that every single person be saved. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, God is not slack concerning His promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That shows you that it is God's will that every single person be healed, I mean be saved. But not everybody is saved, not because God doesn't will it, but because not everybody receives it. Some people aren't even seeking it. Other people who are seeking salvation are doing it incorrectly, thinking that they have to be holy enough and they are thinking it's through religious traditions or they think just believing that there is a God is sufficient. And there's a lot of different reasons. But see, most people right here, those of you watching by, by some other means, most of you believe that God can heal and may even want to heal, but you are waiting on God to heal. But it's the same thing with salvation. It's not God who's saving people. He died for our sins 2,000 years ago. It's already been provided. And when you just confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, Romans 10, 9, you reach out and take salvation. And it's not God who just saved this person. No, you were saved 2,000 years ago, but you've got to reach out and take it. You know, when I was a kid, this is right before I got saved. I got born again when I was eight years old. And so it was somewhere around there, maybe when I was seven years old or something. We had a vacation Bible school in our church. And typically, you know, my family, we had our own pew down here. We were like skunks. We had our own pew. It was our pew. We sat right on the front. But because it was a vacation Bible school, uh, they had us march in according to these groups. And I was all the way at the back, 600 kids there, and I was at the back. And a guy stood up and he took a $1 bill. Today, most kids wouldn't even come up for a $1 bill. But back then, a dollar bill was a big deal. And he took a dollar bill and held it, held it up and he said, I'll give this dollar bill to the first kid that comes up here and takes it. And when he said that, I thought, oh man, of all times to be sitting at the back. And I mean, instantly there was a whole group of kids around him just saying, I want it, I want it. And this guy just kept his uh, dollar bill up in the air and he kept saying, I'll give this dollar bill to the first kid that comes up here and takes it. And everybody is wondering what's going on. Every one of these kids wants it. And he just repeated this like three or four times. And finally, it hit my lightning fast mind what this guy was saying. And I jumped out from back there and I ran down the aisle and I pushed through all of those kids. And he had his hand up in the air like this. And I reached up and grabbed his arm and climbed up his side. And I grabbed that dollar bill. And he said, he said, now all of you wanted it, but that's the first kid that came up here and took it. And see, that's the way salvation is. People say, oh, God, save me if it be your will. And they likewise say, oh, God, heal me. It is God's will. It is God's will. That's not even a factor. But you have to take it. You have to reach out and take healing. That's huge what I'm saying right here. You know what? If this is all you got out of this conference, this would be enough to get you set free right there. Now, there needs to be explanation about how do I take it? What are you talking about? But I'm saying it's this attitude. Instead of the passive attitude of, Oh, God, if it be your will, heal me. That will not get you well. You've got to know what God's will is, and then you've got to receive it. And right before I get into some explaining some other things, let me just make this point and kind of set the stage for the rest of this week. That, you know, there are different ways that you can receive from God. And we are going to incorporate all of those ways into this conference. Because we've got uh, Daniel Kalinda coming. I don't know how many of you know Daniel Kalinda. But he ministers with Reinhard Bonnke. He's actually taking over his ministry from him. And he's, I think I'm correct in saying he's had crusades where there was a million people. 
in the crusade. I mean, it's just phenomenal. And he operates in the gifts of the Holy Spirit and stuff. And that is one way that God heals. We've got Jerry and uh, Ernie Garcia down here. And man, they've been friends of mine for a super long time. They, uh, people in our Bible school love them. But he is just totally different than me. He makes me look like a rock compared to him. He's just, he's up here doing all kinds of things and fire and just, and anyway, we got a lot of different ways to get healing to you. And you know what? There, there's some, I, many of you may like me. Maybe that's the reason you came because you're as dull as I am. I don't know. But for those of you that I'm a little boring and stuff, I guarantee you, you're going to be blessed when Jerry gets up here. He's just, he's on fire. But anyway, my point is that this school and what God has called me to do, what, what uh, Carly and uh, Daniel have done with all of these prayer ministers, we are trying to train you how to just reach out and take that healing instead of having somebody else come and deliver it to you. But if that was the only way that you could receive from God is just through renewing your mind, then there's a lot of Christians that would die because they haven't renewed their mind. They've already got some terminal disease. And if the only way for you to receive was to renew your mind and just get strong in the word and start uh, taking your authority and commanding your healing to come, then there's a lot of Christians that would die. So because God loves all of us, he has these other gifts of the spirit, people that just flow in a supernatural anointing, which I don't have. But others do. And we are bringing these others in, and we're going to get you one way or the other. Amen? <laughs> but even though I, I appreciate these people that have the special giftings and flow in a gift of miracles and things like that, I am really excited about what we're doing. And, and Daniel and Carly... Uh, of course, you experienced this this morning if this was the first time you'd heard them, but they are just methodical, just sitting down and teaching and, and sharing with you how to receive. And our, real, our goal is to get you to a place where you don't have to come to a conference to get healed, where you don't have to have somebody with a special anointing to come along. Now, again, if you need healing and you aren't to the place, well, we got something for you and we're going to reach you one way or the other. But our goal is to get you to where you can receive directly from God because He's already done it. And we're going to share with you how to do this and not only receive your healing, but then go out and heal others. You know, we've got thousands of people here and it's great to see thousands of people come and get healed, but just think if every one of you was to receive this message and then not only go out and get well yourself, but then get to where you could pray for others. Let's just say that in the next month, Everyone here went out and saw at least two people healed. Man, that would triple what the results that's happening right here. And then if you continued to do that over the next few months, we could see tens of thousands of people healed. It's wonderful that God has anointed some people that have these special gifts, but you know what? That is an inefficient way of reaching the world. The better way is if every person just grew and learned how to receive directly from God, then, man, we, we could send you out and in a short period of time, we could be reaching millions of people. I heard an advertisement on the radio today, and it was, I forgot exactly the wording, but it was something about, we are cancer's worst enemy. And then it started talking about some medical treat thing. And I said, that's not true. I said, the gospel is cancer's worst enemy. The truth is cancer's worst enemy. And I was thinking, we need to be advertising that. Man, and their tagline at the end, we're trying to make cancer history. And I said, man, that ought to be our tagline. We're trying to get rid of this stuff, amen. I went down to the hospital this afternoon. I was down there last night praying for people. Man, I'd like to see some of these hospitals closed. Not because I'm against them, but just because we don't need them. We can do this. Brothers and sisters, Jesus has already healed us. Let me just start sharing some scriptures with you on this. Over in 1 Peter chapter 2, and I know many of you, you're going to say, I already know these things. I want to hear something new. You know, that's like a person that I say, I'm going to give you a million dollars. And you say, oh, I've already got money. I don't want any more. That's crazy. Man, if you got money, well... 
a million dollars and just add to it. If you've heard this before, well, then just add it to what you've already heard. Man, it, it, if you've got that attitude, that's one reason you aren't seeing healing is because you don't fully value and honor what God is saying. Faith comes by hearing, Romans chapter 10, verse 17. It didn't say that faith comes by having heard. It has to be current. It has to be hearing. You need to be hearing it. So whether you know this or not, it's good for you. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, it says, or is it, is it, where is it? That's it. I was on the wrong page. Got to get the right verse. Verse 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. It put it in the past tense. Jesus produced healing for you by bearing stripes on his back. He is not in heaven bearing stripes today. He did this on the earth in Herod's judgment hall is where he bore stripes. And that's when you were healed. You were healed before you ever got sick. And yet the average person is coming and saying, oh, Jesus, heal me. You're asking for something that he's already done. You know, often I'll be ministering, if it's a smaller group, I'll be down on the front row and I'll hand somebody my Bible and then I'll say, what do I do if this person asks me to give them their Bible? And yet they've already got my Bible. How do you respond to a person that is asking you for something that they've already got? You'd probably just look at them and not know what to say. It'd probably silence, similar to when you're praying and asking God to heal you. Because you're asking God to do something that He's already done. You've already been healed. And I know some of you right now are saying, well, you're just talking in theory and you're, you're talking about these things that don't exist. I'm telling you, I got pain. I'm telling you, I'm in a wheelchair. I've got all these problems. You know, Rachel, when she was, uh, Raquel, not Rachel, but when Raquel was up here singing, Tonight, and she was just worshiping and glorifying the Lord. I remembered when Raquel and Herman came to school and she was so sick with multiple diseases that they had to drop out of school. And they said, we will be back. And I said, oh, yeah, I've heard that before. But you know what? They came back. And she is today healed. And I mean, she's been healed of multiple incurable diseases. But she, Jesus didn't just now heal her. She just res, learned how to receive her healing. Jesus has already done his part. It's already done. The Lord doesn't need to heal you. And you're saying, but, but I've got pain. I've got all of these things. I've got a doctor's report. All they can do is look in the physical realm. And I'm not going to take time tonight. It would be perfect if I had about two or three sessions to just teach you on what God has shown me, what I call spirit, soul, and body. And if you could get that, it would really answer this. But when the Bible says, by his stripes you were healed, that's not theory. That's not something that isn't real. But if you'll believe it, maybe it'll become real. This is reality. But the healing is in your spirit. In your spirit, you are completely healed. You have the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead living in your spirit. It's not out there somewhere. And if we could just get enough people to pray, or if you can do everything right, you can pray down the Spirit of God. This is how this teaching got started, that we got to clear a hole in the heavens and so our prayers can get up to God. You don't need your prayers to get up to God. That's the reason you bow your head when you pray, so you can look at God. He's right here. Amen. Some of us look like we got more of God than others, but it's not right. God's right here in your spirit, and you got this supernatural raising from the dead power right on the inside of you. It's not out there somewhere. But see, if, as long as you think that it's over there, healing's over there, and I am going to be healed. Did you know that that's actually a statement of unbelief? And somebody, oh no, I believe I'm going to be healed. But you're saying you aren't healed when the Bible says by his stripes you were healed. You are in disagreement with the word. You've already been healed. And you said, but I'm not. It's because you are only thinking in the physical, natural realm. 
Your body may not be healed. Your body may still be hurting. You may have something. But the truth is that you've got the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead living on the inside of you right now if you are born again. It's not out there. It's here. I don't have to say I'm going to be healed. I'm already healed. How can I doubt that I'll get something that I've already got? It just eliminates doubt if you can get to where you understand that, Father, I'm not waiting on you to heal me. By your stripes, I was healed. It is a done deal. I've got the same raising from the dead power on the inside of me that raised Jesus from the dead. I've already got it. And if you were to start from that position, if you were to start from a place to where I am healed, now I'm not denying that we can have sickness and pains and symptoms in our body and things like this. I'm not saying that you ignore that and say that you don't have a physical body. In a sense, that's what Christian science tries to do. They believe that you don't have a physical body. You're only mental. I don't know how many of you have really delved into that and found out, but this is what Christian science... They, the reason they don't believe that they believe in healing is because they don't believe you have a physical body. They believe that you just think you have a physical body and everything is just thinking and so therefore all you got to do is change your thinking and therefore your symptoms and everything will leave because after all, you don't even have a physical body. I've always wanted to go up behind somebody like that and hit them on the head and say, how did you think I was going to hit you on the head if you didn't even see me coming? That's just plain dumb and stupid. Forgive me for being blunt, but I am not denying that you have a physical body. You've got a physical body, and your physical body can hurt. You could be paralyzed. You could be blind. You could be deaf. All these things. I don't deny that that happens, but I'm saying that that's not all there is to you. There is another part, and in your spirit, you already have this raising from the dead power, and the first step in releasing it is acknowledging it. And see, most people, they honestly don't acknowledge the spiritual them and what they have in the spirit. They don't really think that way. And so to them, if they feel pain, if they have a problem in their body, that's truth. And that's all that there is to truth. Everything else is theory. Because here's what I feel. I don't care what you say. I don't care if the Bible says by his stripes I was healed. I am not healed. Because you are looking at the physical body. But see what you're missing is that in the spirit you have this supernatural power. And it says over in Philemon chapter 1 verse 6. The apostle Paul was praying a prayer for his friend Philemon. And he says, I pray that the communication of your faith becomes effectual. That means it begins to work by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. This is how it begins to work. You've got to acknowledge it. And the word acknowledge is really important because it didn't say it comes by you getting every good thing from Christ. No, you've already got it. You just need to acknowledge what you already have. So if you would start from this position, a Father, thank you that I have the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. You know, I've already mentioned that two or three times, but let me give you the reference for that in Ephesians chapter 1. Let me just turn over here and read this to you. He's praying a prayer again in Ephesians chapter 1 and in verse 15. He starts by saying, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Notice what he's praying for them. He's not praying, oh God, pour out your spirit. Oh God, move. Oh God, release your power. That's the way that most people today pray because they don't believe that an, a, until they see or feel something, they don't believe that God is moved. So, oh God, move. Oh God, stretch forth your hand. Oh God, send revival. And it's all about asking God to give people something. But Paul is praying, God, give them a spirit of wisdom and revelation in what they already have. Once you understand what I'm talking about right here, the book of Ephesians is radically different than the typical Christian's life because the first three chapters 
are just talking about what you've already got. It's talking about who you are in Christ. It's talking about that, man, you are this awesome person in the spirit realm. The, the last three chapters are saying, therefore, this is how you need to act and treat other people. But the first three chapters of Ephesians are awesome. And this, this prayer right here, you could just put your name in there. You could say, Father, I pray that you would open up the eyes of me or put your name in there. Andrew, and you pray this prayer. It's a biblical prayer. You know it's according to the will of God. And just pray it and believe this. When I first got started, I prayed this prayer thousands of times. Oh, God, open up the eyes of my understanding. Show me what I've got. Man, this is awesome. And so he said in verse 18, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance, or excuse me, what the, yeah, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe. You know this term, exceeding greatness. It's really redundant. It's the way we would say this today is the super greatness. It's just an expletive talking about that, man, it is above and beyond anything that you can imagine or think. You need to ask God to show you the, the exceeding greatness, the super greatness of his power to us word who believe and according to, the word according to means to the proportion or to the degree of the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but in the world to come. And on and on it goes. But it's saying he wants you to see the exceeding greatness of the power that's already in you. Just open up your eyes to what you've already got. And it's the same power that he used when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Brothers and sisters, we're loaded. And yet we're living. Like, oh God, it's cancer. And I, I, I couldn't tell you the thousands of people that have come to me and says, would you please pray for me? And it's pathetic. They're... they're would you please pray for me? I'm hurting. The doctor says I'm going to die. And without you saying it, you're saying cancer's bigger than me. You've already lost the battle right there. Because you aren't acknowledging what you already have in Christ Jesus. You've got raising from the dead power. I called a friend of mine in Poland today and I talked to him. And you know, when I found out he had terminal cancer and they said there's no chance that he could live, I prayed about it. The Lord told me, he says, he's going to live and not die and it's not that big of a deal. Cancer's no big deal. I, I was telling him this, and he was really encouraged. But you know what? Some people, how can you say that? And again, you revert back to how many people you've seen die of cancer. You revert back to what the medical profession says and stuff. But God says that by his stripes you were healed. He is exalted above every name. Cancer is a name. He's exalted above that. Brothers and sisters, if you knew the power that you had on the inside, you would quit coming up and say, would you please help me, I'm dying. You would not have that approach. You'd come and say, well, would you agree with me? The doctor told me I'm going to die, but it's no big deal. It's no big deal. We're going to be talking about how, you know, Daniel and Carly are going to just give you a lot of really practical stuff. I don't have time to go into all of that. But uh, yes, there's things you need to learn to release it. You know, I've learned a lot about how important your words are, about faith without works is dead and on and on. We could talk about just a lot of things. And so we're going to be sharing things with you. But I'm telling you about an attitude right now. If you just got the attitude that I'm the winner, by his stripes, I was healed. I'm not going to be sick. I refuse to be sick. You know, I was doing my, my Bible study tonight, and one of the questions came in about, anyway, I'm not going to go into all that, but one of the statements I made was, I said the reason that I hadn't been sick in 49 years, and there's only twice that I've really dealt with sickness, and that was because of my own stupidity. One time I got in freezing water in the winter and tried to unplug a drain after I'd been awake for 36 hours on a flight back from England. And I was just done. And I got a cold. 
And then one other time, I ministered 41 times one week, and the next week I ministered 40 times, and I just overdid it, and I had to crawl into bed, and I laid there for about a day, and I thought after a day I was okay, so I went out and split a cord of wood, and I did too much too quick, and I got a sinus infection. And other than that, I don't get sick, and I don't believe in getting sick. But anyway, I made this statement that I hate sickness as much as I hate adultery. I wouldn't submit to sickness. I fight sickness the way I fight the temptation to go commit adultery. And some of you, wow, man, that's weird. You're weird. Well, I think you're weird. When God has already healed you and placed the same power on the inside of you that raised Jesus from the dead, and yet you are just going to accept that, well, I'm older. And you know what? As you get older, you just can't help but have a little poor eyesight and that you got to start slowing down and you got to do... I think it's weird that you would accept that when Moses, under an inferior covenant, he was 120 years old the day he died and he climbed a mountain at 120 years old and it says his natural force wasn't abated nor his eyesight dim. If that could happen for a man under the old covenant... How much more should we be able to walk in health? But people just accept it. And I'm talking about an attitude. We're going to give you a lot of tools about how to do things, but I'm talking about an attitude. You've got to get to where you hate sickness. That you realize Jesus didn't just forgive you of your sins. He healed you of all of your diseases. Psalms 103, verse 3. Of all diseases. Acts chapter 10, verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with power and with the Holy Ghost who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Not oppressed of God, oppressed of the devil. And he healed all. God has already done his work. There isn't a single person here that the Lord is saying, well, I'm not going to heal you. He's already healed you. Every person here, I don't care what you've got, you've already been healed. But it's in spiritual form. That power is on the inside of you in your spirit. And you've got to stir yourself up. You've got to begin. And it starts by acknowledging every good thing and getting rid of this victim mentality where would you please pray for me because sickness, cancer is so much greater than me and I'm dying. And you come with this pathetic attitude. I love you. And I know some of you think I'm being hard. And I guess I am. But Daniel and Carly will be nice to you. And every, everybody else will show you love. I mean, they're gentle and they're kind. I'm just telling you the truth. Some of you, you... One of the reasons people are sick is because you tolerate it. There's people right here that you have things that it's not life-threatening. But you can tolerate. You can live with it. It's not that big of a deal. And as long as you can tolerate it, you will. I'm trying to get you stirred up or you're going to sink to the bottom. You need to get stirred up. That's Bobby's statement. Do you remember him making that? And uh, you need to stir yourself up. And I'm telling you, this is one of the great things. It's... Faith and healing is more than an attitude. You've got to have actions. There is knowledge. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. It says over in 2 Peter chapter 1, all things that pertain unto life and godliness, which includes healing, come to us through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue. So there's multiple things you've got to do. But I'm telling you, your attitude is vital. And most people have stinking thinking and the Bible says, as you think in your heart, that's the way that you are. And the reason, <laughs> I don't know why anybody comes to hear me. <laughs> I think if I was you, I might not come hear me. <laughs> but I love you is the reason I'm telling you the truth. But you know, whether you realize it or not, your life is the way it is because of the way you think. And some of you, oh, that's not true. I didn't ask for this cancer. I didn't ask for this disease. No, but you thought in ways that made you inferior to this. 
you thought things like, well, I'm only human. I'm just a man. And, you know, th this flu is going around. They said it's flu season, and so what can I do? That thinking will make you sick. If you think that, you, you know, well, I'm only human. I'm not only human. One third of me is wall to wall Holy Ghost. I have been filled with the power of God. And if something starts fighting me, man, I get violent. I get angry. Did you know you're commanded to be angry? Look at this in Ephesians. Are you still in Ephesians? Look in Ephesians chapter 4. And in verse 26, it says, Be ye angry, and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Did you know that's a command? Be angry, and sin not. Most people interpret this as, Well, God knows we're human, and we can't do everything perfectly, so He knows you're going to get mad. He, he will give you some grace, but just make sure you get it confessed and repented of before you go to bed every night. That's the way most people interpret this. This is not saying that it's okay to be angry as long as the sun is up. But if the sun is down, you can't be angry. That's not what this is saying. This is saying be angry with a godly anger that is not sin. Be angry and sin not. There is a righteous anger. And then it says let not the sun go down upon your wrath. In other words, keep yourself stirred up. Refuse to just settle to where you get to where you're complacent. And you're passive and you allow things to come. Passiveness is what allows the devil to come into your life. Amen. And again, it comes in many forms, but this thinking about, well, I'm only human. And after all, it's flu season. And after all, this is genetic and it runs in my family. And so I've got a tendency. That makes you passive. Man, you need to stir yourself up. How dare the devil touch me? How dare he do this? I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And i got the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And Satan, I'm going to make you sorry that you ever touched my life. I'm going to rub your nose in this. I'm going to get healed and I'm going to expose it and tell people all around the world about what you've done. And that you get that attitude. The Bible says in James 4, 7, Submit yourselves therefore unto God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The word resist means to actively fight against. Saying, dear devil, please leave me alone, is not resisting the devil. Praying and saying, oh God, I don't know if I can take this anymore. Would you please heal me? That's not resisting the devil. Resisting the devil, you need to get mad. You ought to get mad. You ought to say, how dare the devil come against me? You need to get mad. You know, I couldn't tell you how many times I have just lost my temper at the devil. Now, see, some of you have been taught so much against temper that you just think, oh, you aren't even. I, I was actually preaching in a church one time, and I had the pastor come up later, and he says, hey, we don't even get mad at the devil around here. And I said, that's the problem right there, amen. <laughs> But I, I've, there's been times, I remember one time when Jamie and I were in Seagaville, Texas, and this is during our poverty days, and we were trying to sell a car, and the Lord had told me that that's the way He was going to supply our needs is through the selling of this car. And it had been three weeks. People came and looked at it, but this was a dog. It was, it was pitiful. That thing burned a quart of oil every 50 miles. I didn't have enough money to put uh, antifreeze in it, and so during the winter, the block cracked. You could see the crack and the water had fallen out. But I prayed over it and I drove it for another year with a cracked block. I didn't have money to fix it. And the U-joints were going out. That thing vibrated so bad that it was a, what was it, a 56 Chevy Bel Air, I think is what it was. 64 Chevy Bel Air Impala. But anyway, it was... It was the kind of car that the U-joints, it was vibrating so bad that the keys would come out of the ignition. And we had holes in the floorboard. If you didn't catch it real quick, you'd lose the keys. And if you turned the heater on, it pumped water out on your feet. And when it rained, it rained inside just like outside. And it was a dog. But anyway, that Lord told me that's how he was going to meet our need. And people had come and looked at it, but nobody would buy the thing. And finally, 
we were just in a crisis situation and I knew that the Lord told me this is how he was going to get this money to me. And so I was down at the church building and I got to praying and I just got mad. I mean, I was yelling at the devil. I was, if I could have grabbed him physically, I'd have done him some damage. I was swinging. I was kicking. I was saying, I, I refuse this. And I just got mad. I was screaming at the devil. And I don't know how to describe this, but I just broke through something. I think this is what the old Pentecostals used to call you pray through. But I prayed to where there was no longer any unbelief and I just knew that I knew that I knew that whatever the hindrance was against that was over. And man, I started rejoicing and then I drove home to tell Jamie that our car was sold and our money was coming that day. And before I could even tell her, she says, quick, go back to the church. A guy just called. He's coming down there to pay for it. He's got cash. He wants to buy the car. I didn't even get to tell her about what happened. <laughs> So I went down there, and sure enough, this guy said, can I buy your car? And I said, oh, yeah. But I said, you know what? I started telling him all the things that was wrong with it. And he says, no problem. He says, I want to buy your car. And I said, well, I'm driving around the block. And so we took off, and there was a huge cloud of smoke, and we went around the building, and he came back, and, and he says, could I have it now? And I said, well, yeah. So he paid me cash. For the car. And he told me, he says, did you know the very first day, three weeks ago, that you put a sign on that car, I told my wife that that was my car. And he says, I don't want to drive it. I'm going to use it for parts. And he says, it doesn't matter to me if it's in running condition or whatever. I just want the parts off of it. And he says, for three weeks, my wife and I have argued about this, and this was on a Saturday. And he says, I was home watching a football game. And while I was watching the game, his wife just walked in and threw the money in his lap and says, all right, go get the car. So he called and came down. And, and it was while I was praying. That woman was my hindrance. And I just broke that hindrance, amen. But did you know, after it was over with, I thought about why did it take me so long to get mad? Man, I should have done this three weeks ago when I had $100 more on the price. <laughs> I had come down because it wasn't selling, and he got it at a discount. But you know what? I've seen this so many times that as long as you can tolerate something, you will. But you've got to stir yourself up. you just got to be angry and sin not, and don't ever let it go to bed. Don't ever let it go to rest. And then the next verse says, neither give place to the devil. Or another way of saying this is, if you don't get angry, and if you don't stir yourself up, and if you become passive, you are giving place to the devil. The devil can't do anything to you without your consent and cooperation. Amen. Even sickness. Thank you for that thunderous silence. <laughs> and again, see, the most people think, oh, I didn't cooperate. I did not ask for this. But again, your thinking is wrong. You're thinking, well, I'm only human. You're, you may not be thinking, I want to be sick, but your thinking is sick. You're thinking, well, after all, I'm getting older, and after all, my great aunt died of this same thing. And, and you, you look at this, and you relate to it, and you don't have this attitude. I'm telling you, I don't know how to get it across to people. It seems like it's easier caught than taught. It's an attitude. Now, there are things that you need to do. Yes, you need to understand and you need to renew your mind. And there's a lot of physical things and we are going to be teaching you the things that God has shown us. But I'm telling you, it doesn't matter what you learn about speaking the word if you don't have the right attitude. Faith is not only an attitude, but it is an attitude. It starts with that. And you've got to see yourself well. You've got to know that I've got the same power on the inside of me that raised Christ from the dead. It's not out there and I'm not passively sitting here and waiting and asking God to come heal me. I am taking my healing. I've got it. And I am taking it. And you get that attitude. You get that attitude. You know, Jamie was portraying that lady who touched the hem of his garment out of Mark chapter 5. What a great story. 
This woman pushed through the multitude. It says they were thronging him. And you know the word throng means they were pressing him and touching him. And so let's just say, you know, we got, I don't know, over a thousand people up here upstairs. And if, if I was walking through this group and you were thronging me, that means everybody would be trying to touch me. Everybody would be pressing on me. And if I was walking down the aisle and if a thousand people were trying to touch me and somebody wanted to come up and touch the hem of my jeans, I guarantee you there's no way that you could just walk up and, you know, gracefully reach over and touch the hem. That means that this woman, to me, had to be crawling on her hands and knees. And when you understand that this woman had an issue of blood, which the Old Testament said, if you had an issue of blood, you were unclean. And if anybody touched you while you had an issue of blood, you were unclean. If you sat on a chair, the chair was unclean. If you sat on a saddle, the saddle was unclean. Anything you touched was unclean. Therefore, they made everybody who had an issue of blood yell, unclean, and people would give you a wide berth. And so for this woman to be crawling through this crowd and touching all these people, for her to be exposed as she had an issue of blood, immediately all of these people were unclean. They could have stoned her to death. This woman put her life at risk. This woman was so desperate that she was willing to risk her life, but she had spent all of her living on physicians. She didn't get any better. She is now broke, and this was basically her last deal, and she was willing to risk it all. Did you know that kind of attitude is really good? This is one of the reasons. Some of you won't understand this, but this is one of the reasons. I just was in the hospital last night and this afternoon, but I love it when the doctors tell a person there's no hope, go home and die. I love that. Some people get discouraged by that and quit and give up, but with others, it just erases all other options. They no longer have their faith divided between a medicine or a surgery. They know that God's their only hope, and man, sometimes people just say, this is it, I've got to do it, and I like that attitude. When people get that attitude to where they aren't looking to plan B or plan C, Jesus, you are it. I have no other options. Man, that's a great place to be. It's an awesome place to be. And when you get this attitude and you just start saying, it's mine. You know, when Jamie and I first got started, we had never heard of Copenhagen. Copeland and Hagen. I didn't know that they existed. I didn't know that there had been another person healed in 2,000 years. I was taught in the church that I grew up in that healing passed away with the apostles. But I started studying the Word, and it said, if you are a believer, you'll lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And even though I had never seen or heard of another person ever being healed, I started praying for people who were sick. And I didn't understand. I didn't understand one-tenth of what I know now. I didn't know very much at all. But you know what? I just had a revelation that it is God's will to heal, and I started laying hands on anything that would move. I prayed for all kinds of people. And you know, if you don't quit, an old blind squirrel will come up with a nut every once in a while if he doesn't quit. I didn't know what I was doing, but I just was determined, and that determination, that attitude, I started seeing people healed. We saw a blind woman healed in Sigaville, Texas, before I knew that anybody else had ever been healed. I thought, man, this is awesome. Something brand new that hadn't happened in 2,000 years. <laughs> and I didn't know a lot, but you know what? I had this attitude that, Father, I know somewhere on the inside of me, I got raisins from the dead power. I didn't understand how to do it, but just being absolutely convinced that somehow or another, I know I am healed. It's not going to happen. I've already been healed. And once you get that attitude, you just start fighting. And you, if the more you know, the better it'll work, the quicker it'll work, the easier it'll work. But if you just had that attitude, and if all you knew is that by His stripes I was healed, and it is now in my spirit, the same power that raised Christ from the dead, I don't have to go get 
God to give me something. I've already got it. I just need to acknowledge the good things that are on the inside of me in Christ Jesus. If that's all you knew and if you followed through with that and started resisting the devil, if you got angry at the devil and let him have it, I guarantee you sickness would flee from you. Sickness is demonic. I am not saying that every sickness means you have a demon. But it all comes from the devil. It is a result of sin. And much sickness, much of it is demonic. There's, I can show you dozens of times that Jesus cast demons out of people to affect healing. Matter of fact, I remember talking to Oral Roberts just a couple of months before he died. And Oral Roberts says the greatest healings he ever saw were ones where a demon was involved. Because, man, when the demon leaves, just instantly like that, the physical healing comes. There's a difference between being delivered of a demon and you get instantly healed, and then you just speak to, like, pain or sickness or infection, and the thing dies, but then your body recovers after that. There's different ways of receiving. But anyway, my point is that much sickness, all of it, has its root in the devil and in sin, the original sin of Adam, but a lot of it is just demonic. And I'm guaranteeing you that there's people right here in this room in the overflow watching by uh, live stream right now that if you were to just get angry and take your authority and start rebuking and resisting this, you would find sickness flee from you. Did you know from my, this is andeology. I don't have a scripture to show you for this, but this is my experience over 49 years of ministry that I've seen thousands of people healed of arthritis. And my experience is that arthritis is really a weak demon. It really is. It is not hard at all. I have seen thousands of people healed of arthritis. But the thing that makes arthritis somewhat hard to get over is because you accept it little by little by little. You have a pain in your finger. And because you have it, well, that's not so bad, and so you accept it. And then it's in the next finger, and, and you just let it come slowly, slowly, slowly. You learn to embrace it, and over a period of time, it just has these roots in you, and it may leave the same way it came. You know, I had something happen with my hand, I think a year ago or so, and I was opening up a jar, and man, my hand hurt. I don't know why it hurt. I don't know if it was arthritis. I didn't go get somebody to curse me and tell me what had happened. <laughs> but I just am telling you, I couldn't open a jar because my hand hurt, which I, you know, that's what I've heard other people talk about arthritis. You know what I did? I got mad. I said, no, in the name of Jesus. And I got that jar and I opened it and closed it dozens of times. I resisted it. I commanded pain to leave and I kept doing it until the pain left. If you would fight it when it comes, you know, in just that one little joint, then it'd be simple. It's over. But no, you spend years accepting it and embracing it and letting it happen. And then it may take a little while to get out. But I'm telling you, I have seen thousands of people healed of arthritis. And when you get this attitude that I'm talking about, arthritis will leave you every single time. When you get angry and I will not live this way and you go to speaking to your body and you go to resisting it, arthritis will leave you every single time. Arthritis is not hard. It's just persistent. And you got to get angry. I had three women come into my office one time and all three in one day and all three of them had cancer, terminal cancer. And I was basically sharing this same message with them about be angry. you got to resist this. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And if you'll just resist this, you can overcome it. And one of those ladies, she just looked at me and she says, I just can't do that. I don't get mad at anybody. And she was just a real sweet lady. And she says, I just haven't got in me to get mad even at the devil. And you know what? She died. And she was a nice lady. She was too nice. I'm not saying you're a bad person. I'm saying we've been taught to be as passive as we are. We've been taught to do these things. You had to systematically be taught how to be sick. And some of you think, oh, no, I wasn't. Yeah, you were. You were taught that you, you know, certain things are beyond uh, just 
you can't just live in health all the time. You've got to have certain things. There's a flu season. It's appropriate to get the cold once a year uh, and on and on. And you were taught all of this kind of stuff. One of the reasons I believe that Adam lived to be 930 years is because he didn't know he was over the hill at 40. <laughs> Nobody gave him black balloons. Amen. He wasn't planning on all of this kind of stuff. He didn't know that there was a flu season. He didn't know this stuff. It took 930 years for the devil to kill Adam and Eve because they didn't know how to be sick. And some of you think, well, I haven't pursued this. I hadn't thought about it. You know, if you watch television, I try not to watch much television, but I can't watch television. Every, every time Jamie and I watch television, they come on with these medicine commercials. I think it's because we're old and we watch like Andy Griffith and they know the type of people that watch that. So it's all, it's all medical. They expect you all to have one foot in the grave and they just come on and everything is medicine, medicine, medicine. And they'll, they'll say, take this for your headache. Now it'll cause rapid heartbeat. It'll cause your blood pressure to go up. It'll cause runny stools. It causes death in 30% of the people, but it'll cure your headache. <laughs> and some of you say, well, I don't pursue heat, but you let that junk come at you and you don't realize. Somebody said, well, that doesn't bother me. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33 says, be not deceived. Evil communication corrupts good manners. If you think you can listen to people talk about sickness and do you have to get up in the middle of the night and go to the bathroom? You probably got an enlarged prostate and they start saying all of this. And if you listen to this stuff and you think that doesn't bother me, you're deceived. Was that too subtle? Anybody miss that? You're thinking, oh, this doesn't bother me. It does bother you whether you know it or not. You get... You, get, you let the sewage of this world flow through you, something's going to stick. You walk through a barnyard, you're going to get something on your boots. It's just the way that it works. And I'm telling you, we just, we pay big, big money to have unbelief and negative stuff piped into our homes so that we can hear all of this doubt and unbelief and then we wonder, why is it that I'm not healed? Because you've been taught how to be sick. You've been conditioned You've been told all of this stuff. I'm not asking you to raise your hand on this one. But if this is a typical group, I would be shocked if the majority of the people in here aren't on some type of medication. I would be shocked. And I'm talking about Christians. And I'm not condemning you. You can take all the medicine you want to take. God loves you and you can take medicine, go to heaven, you'll get there quicker. That medicine will kill you. I'm not against you, but I'm saying, if what I'm saying is true, that you have the same power that raised Christ from the dead, and you resist the devil and he'll flee from you, and all of this, if it's true, why is it that Christians are having to depend on all of this other stuff that has these terrible side effects? I mean, after listening to those commercials, I want to say, give me back my headache. Amen. <laughs> I'd rather have a headache than heart problems and impotency and everything else that they're talking about. Man, give me back my headache. Why do you do that stuff? And it costs you a lot of money? Why do you do it? Well, I need it. You've been conditioned that you have to have that. Instead, that Jesus isn't enough. That you have to have all of this stuff. What are you all saying down there? I don't even want to know. But see, you, whether you realize it or not, we've been conditioned to be sick. We've been taught to be sick. And because of it, we tolerate it because after all, it's normal. Normal for who? It's not normal for a person who's understanding who they are and what they have in Christ. It may be normal for the world, but why would you want to compare yourself to them? Why do you want to be like people that don't know the Lord? You know, we're like, we, we got a place right by our house and they've got four horses in this pasture and three cows. And these three cows, usually, it's just like they're joined together. 
They will lay on each other. They stand by each other. They just, it's a herd mentality. You know, that's the reason that you have stampedes and stuff. One starter and the other don't even know what they're stampeding about. They just, it's just a herd mentality. And sad to say, a lot of us have this same mentality. And you know what? We look around and everybody else is sick. Everybody else is beginning to be infirm and all these things. You know, I was talking to Gary Lukey tonight about something and, and we were talking about age and I had some of my Bible college students come out because I had a road fall in and I had to dig it in and put uh, railroad ties in there that were over 200 pounds a piece and I was moving them by myself and they found out that I was doing this and so they said they'd come help me. And anyway, these young bucks came out to help me and you know what? I was out working them. And they were in their 20s. And I was lifting more than they could lift. And I, I'm just saying that you don't have, I'm 68, and you do not have to have one foot in the grave because you're 68. I just had Dean Radke, and we had a meeting with him yesterday, and that guy is, what did he say, 70, 78? 78, and he's still skiing the blacks on the ski slopes with the moguls. This guy, he looks like he's in his 50s or 60s, and he's 78. You do not have to be. I was just with Kenneth Copeland. Kenneth Copeland turned 80, and that guy is stronger than he's ever been. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, you are comparing yourself with the wrong person if you're comparing yourself to this world standard and trying to live down to their standard. We ought to be having a goal up here of walking in supernatural health. You need to be sick and tired of being sick and tired and say, I'm not going to live this way. Amen. You know, I don't know if Carly has shared her testimony yet, but she probably will if she hadn't already. But uh, just real quick, she was in a wheelchair, and it took you, what, a day or so to be able to stand up? She, she was in a wheelchair and had to pull herself up, and it took nearly a day to stand. And it was the next day. I may be getting some of this wrong. But within a short period of time, she decided she was going to take one step. And she took one step. And she thought, if I can take one step, I can take another. So she took another. And it was like from here to that uh, synthesizer that she walked to the front door. And she says, if I can walk that far, I can walk far farther. And she had her friends that were playing tennis two miles down the deal. And the same day that she got out of a wheelchair by just pulling herself up and taking one step in ten minutes, she walked two miles and played tennis. <laughs> same day she came out of a wheelchair. And she didn't understand what she knows now. She's learned a lot about healing now, and she's a lot more effective. But you know what? She had this attitude that she just got sick and tired of living in a wheelchair as a young woman. And this is after you were married, wasn't it? Before you married. But even after you were married, you had what? Epilepsy? And because of that, they couldn't leave her by herself. She couldn't drive. There was things. And so anyway, she applied the same things, and she got healed of epilepsy. And I'm telling you, she knows a lot more about the Word, but she had the right attitude. Just, I am not going to live like this. You know, if it was me, I just hate sickness. I don't get sick. I don't believe in getting sick. Jamie and I have been married 45 years this year, and I threw up once in 45 years. That's right after we got married. And Jamie never understood that. Well, <laughs> I put that in the wrong way. <laughs> that came out wrong. But Jamie's the kind that if she feels sick, she'll, she'll force herself to throw up and get it over with. Not me. And she didn't understand that until she saw me throw up one time. I'm one of these toilet huggers. Man, I roll on the ground. I just, I would just as soon die as throw up. Just shoot me and get it over with. I am not going to throw up. And so anyway, it's been 44 years since I've thrown up. I don't do it. And if I get to where I'm feeling like I'm going to throw up, I get well in a hurry. I mean, I get serious in a hurry. I remember over in Betsy Coy, Wales one time, I ate some fish or something and it had, I guess the fish was bad or something. I started to throw up, but man, I didn't. I got well in a hurry. Anyway, my point is 
I just don't like being sick. I don't imagine most of you like it, but you tolerate I don't tolerate it. I will not be sick. I am not going to be sick. And, and I know some of you are thinking, you can't say that. You don't know. See, that's the reason you're sick. It's because you don't have this attitude. You think that sometimes sickness comes and there's nothing that you can do about it. I'm telling you that there is no time that the Word of God won't work in your life. You can be healed all of the time. All of the time. And if you think, well, you can't do that, well, then that's the reason you get sick. I'm not condemning anybody. This is a Healing is Here conference. I don't always say these things to people because I know that this is offensive to a lot of people, but you came for healing. And I'm telling you, a lot of healing begins with the way you, the attitude that you have towards sickness. And there are some of you that tolerate it. You're passive towards it. You may not like it, but you can live with it. And as long as you can live with it, you will. You need to get sick and tired of being sick and tired. You need to say it's yours. And by doing that, that doesn't make God move. God has already moved. You aren't pressuring God. You aren't twisting God's arm and laying hold of the horns of the altar and shaking it until God comes out. That's not what you're doing with this attitude. But what you're doing is saying, Father, you've already done your part. If there's a problem, it's on my part. And I am going to get rid of my stinking thinking. I am going to fight this thing like the plague that it is, and I am going to change me. Your attitude change is for you, and it really affects the devil. Again, you have to resist the devil to get him to flee from you. And that's not passive. It's active. It's tough. And you, there are people that are not really resisting the devil. You're pleading with God and hoping the devil leaves. But that's not the same thing. You know, let me use this one last example. I know I've got to quit. But I've been a jogger most of my life. And I've had dogs come out against me. One time I was in Sylacauga, Alabama. And I had five little dogs tree me. I was out at 5 o'clock in the morning running. And these dogs came and attacked me and I climbed a tree. And I had to stay there until 7 or 7.30 when the people woke up and were leaving. I was treed for a couple of hours by these dogs. And I've never been just terrified of dogs, but I've had dogs chase me and, you know, try and attack me and stuff. And it bothered me. And then one time I was in Trinidad, Colorado. I was holding a meeting, I stayed in people's homes, and this guy had a pit bulldog that was, uh, had all of these trophies, I mean dozens of them, on the wall and on mantles about being an attack dog. <laughs> so here was a pit bulldog, which is famous for being mean and hurting people, and this was a trained pit bulldog to be an attack dog. And anyway, when it came time to go to bed, I was fine as long as the family was up because I knew that they had control his dog, but they, were, they wanted me to sleep in the room with this pit bulldog. And I said, what happens if I have to get up during the night? And they said, no problem. And I said, no problem. And I looked over at all the attack trophies and stuff, and I said, this is an attack dog. And the guy said, it's an attack dog. It's not a mean dog. And I said, what's the difference? And he explained to me that they had somebody break into their house and this dog attacked them and pulled the man to the ground and he laid there for over two hours. I think it was maybe four hours until they came home and this dog had his, arm, his mouth around the guy's arm and if he started to get up, he would squeeze, but he never broke the skin. He said he never hurt him. He says an attack dog is trained to do certain things, but they're not a mean dog. He says a dog that would just bite you is a mean dog. He says, I'd kill a dog like that. And when he said that, it's just like a light went on on the inside of me. I've been letting dogs intimidate me. <laughs> and I remembered scripture that the fear of me and the dread of me is upon every beast of the field. That's right. And did you know it changed my attitude? And right after that, I was running right here in Woodland Park. We lived in Woodland Park at the time. 
and I was jogging, and there was this one dog. You know, when dogs bark at you and come out, those really aren't the ones you have to worry about. It's the ones that don't bark and that are just going for you. Those are the ones that are bad. And anyway, there was this one dog that lived under a porch, and every time I went down that road, Kelly Road over here, he would come out against me, and I had had to fight this dog a bunch of times. And anyway, I was running, and I was prepared. I had a brand new attitude. And I was waiting on that dog. Sure enough, when I passed that house, that dog came out after me. And I mean, I got down in his face. I was kicking, uh, swinging, yelling at that dog. And I would have hurt it if I would have ever touched it. But that dog saw me, and it backed up, and it yelped, and it ran under the porch. <laughs> And that, after that, every time I'd run down that street, that dog would be out in the yard and he'd run and get under that porch every time. And did you know since that time, I've never had a dog back me down. I had two uh, Doberman Pinchers come out against me, two of them. And I got down in their face yelling and screaming at them, and they both ran down the road with me, the jogger, chasing them. And you know what? The scripture says that God has given us authority. I just visited a friend of mine in Kenya. And his wife was healed of, um, what was that? It was um, MS. And she was healed of MS and she's now over it. And she's been over it for 20-something years. But she still doesn't walk exactly right. She doesn't, isn't able to run. She didn't totally get restored to where she was. But she doesn't have MS anymore. And their minister is in Kenya. And when we were over there... They were showing us these elephants, and they were out watching these elephants, and some kid got to throwing rocks at this bull elephant, and he wound up charging them. And so they started running. And anyway, Mike ran, but Pat couldn't run very good, and so she got behind a little tree about this big with a big old bull elephant, and that bull elephant just turned and was headed straight for her, and Mike knew that he needed to protect her, so he just went back and stood in front of that elephant and yelled at it in the name of Jesus, and that thing stopped about two or three feet away, just pawing the ground, and him yelling at that thing, and he backed it up, and she had dropped her glasses, and they were, I think, $600 pair of glasses, and so he backed that elephant up and went and got her glasses. Some of you, well, I, I don't think I could do that. Well, then it won't work for you. <laughs> but if you understand that the fear of you and the dread of you is upon every beast of this field. I fought, I hadn't fought, but I've dealt with bears on our property and stuff like that. And I've backed them down and I've dealt with all kinds of stuff. I've broken horses before by just taking authority over them and riding them. And some, I don't believe that. Well, then it won't work for you. But I'm telling you, if you get this attitude, again, I'm not discounting knowledge and you learning how to do things. That makes it easier and stuff. But you just get this attitude that I'm the one with authority. And I refuse to let the devil make me live like this. You get that attitude, that is a large part. I would say probably a majority of what you need to get healed is just getting to a place to where I'm not going to live this way and you take your authority and you speak to your problem instead of speaking to God about your problem and you take your authority and begin to use it and I guarantee you, you will see healing manifest. Satan is a defeated foe. Sickness has been cured by the Lord Jesus and it's not him, it's not him that only heals a few people. It's just the fact that there's only a few people that get stirred up and receive it. And if that's true, which it is, then praise God, your response ought to be, God, don't look any further. I'm getting this attitude. I'm not leaving this place sick. I'm not going to remain sick. You can choose. The Lord says, choose you this day. What you want, life or death, blessing or cursing. And just in case anybody's not smart enough to figure that one out, he says, choose life. <laughs> he gives you the answer to this little quiz. I'm telling you, you can choose life. You can choose to be well. Amen. 
I know some of you think, you can't do that. Well, it won't work for you. But we're, we're just, I love you. I know that I'm uh, not as, uh, I'm, I'm more like Trump. I just, I'm, not, I'm not a politician. I don't, you know, sometimes the only time I open my mouth is to change feet. But I'm telling you what I'm saying is true. And the others will be nicer, and you'll feel better tomorrow, so please come back. Don't let me run everybody off. But I'm telling you, you need to just get angry. Satan is stealing from you. He's stealing money from you. You aren't able to do certain things. And if nothing else, even if you don't care about yourself, man, wouldn't it be awesome to go back totally healed and give a testimony to your family? to your church, to the people you work with that know that you've had all of these things, even if it's not for you, think about how you could use this to glorify the Lord. I just don't know why people put up with sickness. I've had people come and, and list 20 and 30 things that are wrong with them. And I just say, why did you let this happen? And people will just look at me like, I didn't let this happen. Yes, you did. It may have been through ignorance. It may have been because you didn't know the power and the authority that you had. But Satan cannot do anything to you without your consent and cooperation. He can't make you sick if you don't cooperate with him. I suggest you quit cooperating. And it starts with acknowledging all of the good things that are in you. That's what makes your faith effectual. Father, I just thank you for these truths that you've shown me. I thank you for the way it's working in my life, the way I've seen it change other people's lives. And I share these truths with people here tonight. And Father, I believe that you are just stirring people up, that we will take our authority and refuse to be sick, that we are going to refuse this, that we don't have to take it. We do not have to put up with this. I don't care what it is. Father, I believe that you heal all of our sickness and all of our diseases. That Jesus is exalted above everything. That Jesus went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. All of us. Father, let this be the, the Healing is Here conference where every single person manifests the healing. We know that you've provided it. Father, help every person. I pray that those that have just, they live off of pity. They live off of people showing compassion to them because of their terrible situation. Father, I have compassion, but I'm, I have a compassion enough to stir them up. Father, I pray that you make these people get away from that and get to where they are going to walk in healing, to where they aren't going to live this way anymore. In the name of Jesus, Father, I just release a holy, godly anger into people for the devil and for what he's trying to do, how he's destroying their life. Satan, we come against you. You're a liar. I've exposed you tonight. 